What's up everyone, Soldier First Class here, and today's mission we're going to be talking about some new major info revealed in the Final Fantasy VII Rebirth Ultimania. Now this just came out either yesterday, I guess technically in Japan, or today in the Western world. We're going to be going over uh, Aerith's Fate, the multiverse, um, everything pretty much in between, and the development of part three and the future of this series. I want you to know that before we get into this, there will obviously be really major spoilers for the story of Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. This will have major, major ending spoilers, so I just wanted to get that out of the way. So let's go ahead and go to Audrey, aka Itai Kimochi on Twitter, and the first thing we're going to talk about is the multiple worlds. Apparently there's a summary of the world's info and it says there are multiple worlds that exist. Zack's last stand against the Shinra soldiers takes place in a different world than the one we know. The worlds are differentiated by the stamps dog appearance. There's going to be some stuff that we know already. Sephiroth knows about these worlds and is trying to extend the life of the planet. The white materia that Aerith in the current world has is supposed to counter Meteor, but it's lost its power and is transparent. The Aerith from another world entrusts her white materia to Cloud so he can deliver it to the Aerith in the current world. So, in other words, we are confirming basically that there are multiple versions of Aerith here. Depending on Zack's choices, worlds become divided. At the moment, there are six different worlds based on the different stamp dogs. The world where Zack last appears in at the church doesn't have a stamp dog to refer to, so where is that world exactly? This means there are potentially seven worlds, of course there is, and the worlds are differentiated by Beagle, Terrier, Yorkshire Terrier, Pug, Corgi, and Chihuahua. The Yorkshire Terrier, Pug, and Corgi worlds divided are created based on the choices Zax made and presumably shown in the Rainbow Light. Um, I want to go into this further because me and Baby Seal actually had a conversation about this on Seal Team 7 and we were talking about it, whether or not Zax's choices had anything to do with it or if it was really something else or if the rainbow actually represented the changes in worlds but it does apparently clarify seal asked her if the rainbow effect represents new world creation i counted 273 rainbows in the game not including limit breaks so is there 273 worlds does it specifically point to the rainbow and she says it just specifies zach's choices are the ones that create new world paths apparently we were semi-right slash semi-wrong about how this works. Um, apparently, Zack's choices actually do determine how this changes. I don't know why Zack, of all people, has like the deciding factor on what actually happens, but it's a little weird. Um, doesn't really feel that well done, I guess. I don't know. I'm sure part three will give context, but it's kind of a weird designation. So I'll put this on screen, but I wanted to talk about this when we talked about the rainbow stuff, because I feel like it might be an interesting connection. In the original, Aerith was kind of like a, you know, the, the point of her death was that it was senseless, it was cruel, it was taking something away from you that you couldn't get back. It was it was just one of those things that was had purpose and meaning. And in Rebirth, I even though I don't like the way it was handled, if we're going to look at the rainbow and how it might affect this story going forward. I do kind of want to make some connections with something that I found really interesting and that I remembered from back when I was in, uh, when I when I was a kid going to church regularly, I do remember this passage, and it was Genesis 9, and I'll, I'll put it on the screen, but the rainbow that I have put in the sky will be my sign to you and to every living creature on earth. It will remind you that I will keep this promise forever. When I send clouds over the earth, clouds, and a rainbow appears in the sky, I will remember my promise to you and to all other living creatures. Never again will I let floodwaters destroy all life. When I see the rainbow in the sky, I will always remember the promise that I have made to every living creature. The rainbow will be the sign of that solemn promise. Now, if we want to connect this to Aerith, Aerith, anytime we see the White Whispers or fate has been changed or something to do with Aerith has happened, we see a rainbow. She makes promises to Cloud at the end of the game about how she's going to stop Meteor. I think if you really want to make this connection to the rainbow and everything, you could look at this passage and say that they're treating Aerith in this rebirth or this remake series as some kind of savior. And if that is the case, this connection here actually makes a lot of sense. So this is just a note that I wanted to throw in here. I'm not trying to get overly religious or anything like that. Um, but it is something that I did remember from those days, and I wanted to share with you guys as my audience. And then, Nojima actually confirmed that there are, in fact, multiple worlds in this game. This is not like a, 
oh, a red herring, fake, multiverse. There are multiple worlds in this game, and the writer of the game confirms it. So I think that pretty much seals that one. And that the aspect of the story, along with the mystery surrounding Aerith's white materia, will be made clear in FF7 Remake Part 3. In fact, he says he is almost done writing the main scenario for Part 3, and there will be a tumultuous buildup of events leading to the ending, but he hopes that everyone looks forward to it. This interview, she says, is done in February of this year. So it is probably already done. I think there's one later that says that it is done. Um, Nomura probably says it. But yeah, so that basically confirms there are, this is a multiverse. This is something that we, you should have known playing the game, but there are still people out there denying that this is multiverse. And I honestly don't know how. I mean, I kind of get it, but at the same time, I don't really know how you can convince me that it's not a multiverse. Now, something I did find interesting is they go on to talk about um, Sephiroth in the final battle. And Nomura actually states, Sephiroth's existence can actually transcend worlds and exist at the same time in multiple worlds. When Zack comes to help Cloud fight Sephiroth, they both exist in a moment where the two worlds join. Further, when Zack, Cloud, and the other party members all fight Sephiroth Reborn, though they are presumably existing in separate worlds, they are still fighting the same entity. Which, I actually, I, I know a lot of people know that I don't like the ending of this game, and that's for a lot of reasons, but one is the multiverse stuff. But I do think it's cool that they tied all the worlds together in a way that when you're fighting Sephiroth Reborn, you are actually still fighting the same version of Sephiroth Reborn. It, it is cool to me that that's how they kind of tied them together. Even though I do not like multiverses, I've never been a fan of multiverses, I think this is still a, a really cool way to have it done, If in my opinion. So the big one, Aerith's Fate. Uh, a lot of people are going back and forth on whether they think that she lived, whether she died. I think she died, um, but now that they've confirmed there's multiple versions of Aerith, not really sure how that plays in. So, it is hard to tell whether she lives or dies. Based on what we see, it can lead to different interpretations. However, what is confirmed is the party sees something completely different than Cloud, which... Playing the game, you should know that. The party fights Jenova with full limit breaks because of anger, except for Cloud, and Barrett even says that this is a battle of mourning for her. So, again, confirming some of the the theories that we had that Cloud isn't seeing what we see because he's there's something wrong with his mind, and that's why he doesn't have a limit break. There's a scene where Cloud is holding Aerith and speaking something, but it's drowned out by the noise, so we do not know what they said. That's probably the monologue, if I had to guess. Because um, shortly after that, Sephiroth kind of goes into the same speech that he went to in the original. After the fight at Forgotten Capital, Aerith appears next to Cloud, but Katifa cannot see her. See that? The party seems to be sitting at the edge of a lake where Aerith should have been laid to rest in the original game. Missed opportunity. It is unknown how and where Aerith came from to aid Cloud in the last fight against Sephiroth. Is the Aerith at the ending actually alive, or is she from the live stream, or is she just a hallucination made by Cloud? At the moment, we do not know. The world where Zack is alive, or the world where Aerith and Cloud appeared in the Sector 5 slums, has a crack in the sky. Does it mean to signify the end of the world, or? And it ends there, but it continues here with... Nomura commented, He mentions that many wanted to see Aerith avoid that fate in the OG for FF7 Rebirth, and that's why the team delivered having Cloud successfully deflect Sephiroth. So it's clear that he is successful. In the game, in the Ultimania, they're, they're flat out saying he was successful in blocking the blade. And we know that different choices have made different worlds appear. I don't think it's that much of a stretch for people that are, that are theorizing that when Cloud deflected the blade, he created an alternate world where she lived. Now, whether or not those worlds are instantly bleeding together, and maybe Sephiroth is controlling that and made those two worlds combined and now no matter what happens she still dies i don't know i mean that's something you could explore uh but it it does confirm he was successful so it may not have been just in his mind but we don't really know the exact parameters of what's going on uh there is a question that then asks why every time cloud gets a headache with noise he sees random flashbacks Nomura says there are a lot of elements that go into this, but for now, all he can say is it represents Cloud's state of mind, rejecting those scenes from the flashback. So it's kind of like what I said during my playthrough. I said that when Cloud gets a headache, that is him rejecting, or maybe it's some sort of PTSD or trauma kicking up, where it doesn't allow him to process what's going on. 
So therefore, things that he should know or that have come into his mind at a time where he's not ready for them have caused these headaches, and I think that's pretty obvious from playing the game. Nomura said... Oh, also to note the follow-up Q&A, this is Nomura saying that Cloud and Zack's fight shows that two worlds are existing at the same time, and Sephiroth's existence can transcend multiple worlds, so it's all relative and up to interpretation. So, again, we're confirming multiple worlds. Zack exists in another world, but those two worlds combined to... or are rather existing at the same time so they could fight Sephiroth together, which, in my opinion, was the most cringe moment of the entire game, but that's just me. Then we have some development information. Katase has hopes that the world of FF7 may continue on even after finishing the FF7 Remake prol Trilogy, but they need to wrap up Part 3 first and foremost. I think anybody that's a fan of Square Enix that knows this company knows that Final Fantasy VII Rebirth slash the third game is not the ending of this, of this world. Whether that's a good thing or not, that's up to the fans to, to decide, but I kind of wish, as much as I have loved Rebirth, and as much as I'm sure that I will love Part 3, because I do love the game, I want everybody to know that, that I do love the game, it's the ending I don't like, and that doesn't mean that you hate the entire game because you don't like the ending. There's plenty of games I love, like Mass Effect 3 had a dog shit ending, but I still love Mass Effect 3. I don't know whether or not FF7 should keep going. What other stories can they really tell after this? I mean, they could redo the books, they could redo Advent Children, all that, but it just kind of feels like maybe this IP needs to be laid to rest after all this. Uh, I don't know. It's just personal opinion. Um, I think once you dilute something so much, it kind of starts to lose its impact, so that's kind of where I'm thinking with this. Um, he thinks Part 3 will perhaps be his last involvement with a game in the FF7 series due to his age. In lieu of that, he wants to bring this trilogy to a close with hopes that Cloud and all the characters will be happy at the end. Don't really like that. He wants to finish the trilogy on a positive note without leaving behind any unfinished business, but that's just his own personal opinion on the matter. I do not like the idea of giving this story a happy ending. That's not really what Final Fantasy VII was about to me. I mean, I know that's, that's subjective, obviously. People are going to want Aerith to live. They're going to want Zack to live. They're going to want all this happy bullshit that I don't really agree with. And that's fine. Totally subjective. Up to you guys. Just not for me. FF7 Remake Part 3 Main Story has already been completed. There's the confirmation. And Nomura thinks they will perhaps start voice recording in the near future. He remarks that Katase proposed an idea to him about something very important to include, even though it wasn't in the original game, and Nomura is pondering how to deliver. He thinks it will surely make people happy if they can do it well. That's subjective. Katase hopes to deliver an amazing product for Part 3 without having to sacrifice quality over time. He says the reason why FF7 Rebirth was such an efficient development period was because they retained the same staff as the previous installment, and Part 3 will also have the same team. That's a very good thing. Katase mentions FF7 Rebirth was actually done within three years since about one year was developing the DLC for Remake, and he hopes to be able to stick with that schedule for Part 3 too. That's actually super efficient for how well this game turned out. Like, I keep saying it, and I, I, I really want to hammer this home. This game is really well done for the short turnaround it had, and for the fact that it had a lot of HD towns and stuff, and again, this is a company that said several years ago, HD towns are too hard. So, I really appreciate this, and, and I'm glad that the development team is having a good time with it. Hamaguchi says in the FF7 Rebirth Ultimania that Part 3 should cover parts related to the OG, such as Icicle Inn and the Northern Crater, the awakening of the weapons, flying around in airships, etc., However, he is wondering how exactly to represent the freedom of flying in an airship with a game in such high graphic detail. He hopes to be able to bring something surprising to the experience, much like how Part 1 and Part 2 introduce new and exciting features as well. This is what I'm most excited for, I think, uh, the, the high wind and how this is going to interact. I really think that we're going to get a lot of interactions with the weapons in the high wind, and I think that's going to be cool as hell. Like, if, if you guys played Final Fantasy X... There was a moment where Evre was flying through the air, and the party was able to look out the window and see Evre. And then when they go out on the the, the deck of the of the I can't think of the airship right now, the airship in ten, you know, you see 
ever a flying around. And I think that'd be really, really cool to have on the high wind where you could look out the window and see the weapons. I think that'd be so dope. That is about it, guys. Other than a few, like, character profiles and stuff like that, um, I think they did a really good job of revealing some information in this without giving, like, too much away. It's it's good that they, they, they have confirmed a few things, like multiverses, um, the fact that, like, how they how they kind of are created because now we can go back and look at our discussions and say okay well if you didn't think there was a multiverse now there definitely is if you didn't think that cloud was successful in blocking the blade and maybe created another world he did so i think like this is where people need to look at it and be like okay this is what the devs are telling us in the book this is not a lie this is not a red herring this is not whatever people come up with to justify anything we are dealing with multiverses and potential saving of characters that weren't saved in the original, which I have my feelings about, but that's not the point. The point is, we've gotten the information here. It's out. It's black and white. What do we do with that information is up to us. So, I want to say thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this breakdown of the Ultimania information, we might do another video due to uh, more information coming out later, but... Audrey says this, this is basically the most important stuff and the stuff that she found interesting. So that being said, don't forget to leave a like on the video if you enjoyed the content here and subscribe to the channel and, re and turn those notifications to all because I'd love to see your guys' bright smiling faces in the comment section down below. And uh, to do that, kind of need notifications set to all because YouTube is broken. Uh, <laughs> that being said, guys, thank you for watching and uh, I'm Soldier First Class. And I'll see you in the next one. Later, guys.